We're used to the idea that every war has an endpoint, a discrete moment in time when the conflict is resolved, one side stands triumphant, and lasting peace takes hold. Sometimes that end takes the form of a dramatic defeat, such as the fall of Berlin. Other times it comes from painstaking negotiations, such as those that ended the Troubles. Other wars can simply fizzle out or be interrupted by much bigger crises. And then you have the category we're talking about today. The wars that don't end, but are simply placed in the cooler. The fighting put on ice, but the deeper issues never solved. Known as frozen conflicts, they represent some of the most likely sites of future wars. Dotted across Europe, Asia, and Africa, frozen conflicts were once thought to be manageable. Hangovers from the days of decolonization or the end of the Cold War that could be contained with watchful diplomacy. But not anymore. In the past few years, multiple frozen conflicts have reignited. Nagorno-Karabakh in the Caucasus, the Western Sahara conflict in North Africa, even the devastating Ukraine war exploded out of the icy conflict in Donbass. The worrying part? There could be more to come. From Taiwan to Kosovo to Northeast Syria, our world is riddled with frozen conflicts that could heat up again at any moment. Aptly for a phrase often used regarding contested regions, the precise meaning of the term frozen conflict is itself hotly debated. Some use it to mean any war that finished without an official peace treaty, even if the post-conflict status quo is now a settled fact. The Wilson Center, for example, has a definition that runs, Frozen conflicts describe places where fighting took place and has come to an end, yet no overall political solution, such as a peace treaty, has been reached. Such a definition is also used by the Peace Research Center in Prague and naturally covers a wide spectrum. This includes the Korean War, which stopped in 1953 but without North and South Korea ever signing a formal peace. But it also includes things like Israel and Iraq, which fought one another to a ceasefire in 1948, which Baghdad subsequently refused to sign. For our purposes today, that's really too broad a definition. After all, a renewed Iraq-Israeli war is unlikely to be on anyone's bingo card for the 2020s. So, we're going to zero in on a much narrower definition of frozen conflicts, one that's focused on a specific internal dynamic for the nations affected. A dynamic that involves a conflict ending not just with a lack of peace, but with the ongoing existence of a piece of territory outside the central government's control. A major relevant example is China and Taiwan. After the Chinese Civil War ended in 1949 with a communist victory, nationalist forces under Chiang Kai-shek fled to Taiwan, where they established a separate state. Like North and South Korea, both Beijing and Taipei today claim the entirety of China as their own. The major difference in this case, though, is that the world's institutions tend to agree. While both North and South Korea sit in the UN, Taiwan lost its seat to China back in the 1970s. Today, only 13 nations recognize Taiwan's independence. In many ways, this is a model for the frozen conflicts that we're covering in this video. A situation in which a war was fought, peace found without a deal, and in which a chunk of territory remains beyond the grasp of the political center as a semi-recognized or unrecognized state. Oh, and also, it's one in which violence has the potential to re-erupt at any moment. Grouping all of these conditions together is important because it allows us to likewise recognize what isn't a frozen conflict. For instance, Northern Ireland fails the test because while there are still deep divisions over the issue of unification with Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement created a constitutional solution for this in the form of a future referendum. Equally, it's important to only count those places with potential for violence. Western Sahara, for example, was a frozen conflict for decades, but because fighting restarted in 2020, we'd no longer consider it frozen. With our definition in hand, we can now start identifying candidates all around the world. Here in Europe, the biggest example is going to be Kosovo, both because of Kosovo's semi-unrecognized nature within Serbia, but also because of Serb enclaves within Kosovo that are mostly outside Pristina's control. Still within the EU, if not actually part of the European continent, the island of Cyprus has been divided since 1974, with the northern half acting as a de facto state backed by Turkey. And speaking of Turkey, right on the other side of the border is a far more recent frozen conflict. Northeast Syria has been ruled as an unrecognized state by Kurdish forces since the early days of the Syrian civil war. 
All of these unresolved conflicts fit our narrower definition of frozen. They also broadly adhere to two extra criteria laid down by the Foreign Policy Research Institute. One, the longer a conflict remains frozen, the prospect of a solution based on mutual compromise becomes more unlikely. And two, the longer the conflict remains frozen, returning to the pre-war status quo becomes progressively less likely. But this is just one class of such conflicts. There's a second class, too. The one the term frozen conflict was initially identified with. A special class, all of its own. Post-Soviet frozen conflicts. It's here that we find some of the best known of all. Transnistria in Moldova, South Ossetia and Abkhazia in Georgia, Nagorno-Karabakh on the border of Armenia and Azerbaijan. At first glance, there's little to differentiate these from the ones that we mentioned earlier. Look a little deeper, though, and it soon becomes clear why the post-Soviet frozen conflicts are in a class all of their own. They've all been deeply influenced by one malign actor. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, it didn't just herald the death of decades of communist dreams, it also heralded the birth of a slew of new countries as its constituent republics raced for the exit. Unfortunately for peace prospects, though, the majority of these new nations came with significant minorities. During the heyday of the USSR, national minorities had been granted certain levels of devolution. So a full Soviet republic like Georgia might itself contain a second level republic, like the Abkhaz ASSR, but also an autonomous oblast like South Ossetia. In each case, the autonomy granted to these lower level regions might recognize an ethnic or religious difference, or just echo how things used to be back in Tsarist times. But the reasons behind this complex system don't really matter. What matters is that several of these lower level republics and autonomous oblasts emerged from the ruins of the Soviet Empire wanting their own independence. The result was a series of wars fought in the post-Soviet period, several of which we've already touched on in other videos. Some of these, like the Chechen Wars, were brutally resolved, but enough wound up becoming frozen that post-Soviet conflicts became its whole own thing. And one thing they nearly all shared? Excessive interference from Russia. The Transnistrian conflict in Moldova, the two civil wars in Georgia, and much later the Donbass conflict in Ukraine all featured Kremlin machinations, often in the form of Russian boots on the ground as peacekeepers. In each of these examples, Russia presented itself as a neutral actor that could help negotiate and maintain peace. Each time, though, it openly favored the breakaway nations, propping them up with economic assistance, selling them cheap oil, handing out Russian passports, and in some cases even recognizing them as independent states. Officially, the Kremlin's line has long been that it was doing this to protect ethnic Russians trapped as minorities in post-Soviet states. Unofficially, though, there's a much simpler explanation. The existence of these frozen conflicts long allowed Moscow to control and manipulate the countries on its borders. The advantages to these conflicts were twofold. One, they stopped the states engaged in them from drifting toward the West since both the EU and NATO won't accept countries that can't control their borders. Famously, this was what torpedoed Georgia's chances of joining NATO. As Condoleezza Rice later told the New York Times, the German position was, you could not take in a country with a frozen conflict like Georgia. The second advantage to these conflicts is that they kept former Soviet states firmly within Russia's sphere of influence. They were unable to back away from Moscow's demands or forge their own destinies. For a quick illustration, let's have a look at Moldova. Since the 1992 war, the tiny former Soviet Republic has been cleaved in two, with a sliver of its land in the Far East under the control of a self-proclaimed state known as Transnistria. This is a state guarded by roughly 2,000 Russian peacekeepers. Because the conflict is frozen, Moldova has been unable to integrate further with the West. At the same time, Moscow has been able to use the existence of its proxies on Moldovan territory to manipulate Chisinau. This influence has been so useful that the Kremlin tried to formalize it. In 2003, Russia pushed the Cossack Memorandum as something that would achieve lasting peace between Moldova and Transnistria. The problem? The memorandum envisioned turning Moldova into a federal state in which each constituent part would be empowered to veto all major decisions. In practice, this would mean Putin could phone up his buddies in Transnistria and ask them to kill any Moldovan legislation he didn't like. The frozen conflict would have ended, but at the cost of Moldova's sovereignty. You can see the exact same logic at play in the Minsk II agreement to end the 2014 conflict in Ukraine's Donbass. Proposed when Ukrainian forces were getting hammered by Russian-backed separatists, Minsk II mostly dealt with ending the violence and holding elections. However, it also contained an infamous paragraph, Article 11. 
Under Article 11, the Russian-backed Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics would have been free to pursue their own relations with Moscow, independent of Ukraine's government. They would have been able to create their own police force and choose judges and prosecutors. Even worse were the 2015 proposals that Russia pushed, but which Ukraine never signed nor ratified. These included giving the statelers full control of the Russia-Ukraine border, their own state budgets, and rights to pursue their own foreign policy, and the power to hold referendums or declare states of emergency. As icing on the cake, Ukraine uh, would have to write a neutrality clause into its constitution. Neutrality, in this case being Russian for doing whatever the Kremlin wanted. Just like the Cossack Memorandum, Minsk II was never fully implemented, for the good reason that it would have turned Ukraine into a mere Russian puppet. But its stipulations, negotiated with the help of France and Germany, offer a clear insight into Vladimir Putin's reasons for indulging these frozen conflicts. You can likewise see Kremlin manipulation in the nagorno karabakh conflict, a once frozen war that differed from its post-Soviet counterparts by not involving a Russian minority in its breakaway state. Instead, ethnic Armenians fought for independence from Azerbaijan in the mid-1990s, leading to a stalemate. But even this could still be manipulated by Moscow. As Armenia's military guarantor, Russia used Nagorno-Karabakh to keep Yerevan from drifting toward the west. In 2012, worry of renewed war with Azerbaijan made Armenia ditch a planned association agreement with the EU. Still, for all we've highlighted the issue in this chapter, it's worth noting that not all frozen conflicts feature Russian manipulation. It's time to take a quick whirlwind tour of our world's other unresolved conflicts. Back in the first chapter, we mentioned how the best-known frozen conflict on the planet is probably the unresolved civil war between China and Taiwan. Utterly unrelated to Russia or the USSR, this long frozen war nonetheless features an extremely similar dynamic. There's a mostly unrecognized state within the central government's internationally accepted borders that's backed by an outside actor. Or in this case, actors plural. Taiwan is backed by the USA, but also by much of Europe. At the same time, the deeper issues remain unresolved, and the potential for violence is there, bubbling away. It's not for nothing that Xi Jinping has made a central goal of his rule the reconquest of the breakaway islands. Of course, the parallels are not perfect. Taiwan's backers are hardly able to use Taipei to dominate Chinese foreign policy, nor is China a vastly smaller, weaker state than the US or the EU. Still, there are enough common threads to tie this frozen conflict to others that we've already mentioned. But while Taiwan and China may be the most worrying example out there, it's far from the only one. As we briefly touched on earlier, there's even a frozen conflict within the EU. The history of North Cyprus is exceptionally complex, and something that we should probably consider doing a whole other video on. Let us know in the comments if you want that. But the Crib Notes version of it is that in 1963, inter-ethnic violence erupted on the islands between Greek and Turkish Cypriots, violence that eventually exploded into the 1974 Turkish invasion. What followed was a dramatic four-week war that killed thousands and left Cyprus bitterly divided. In the aftermath, the Turkish Cypriots in the north declared independence, a move only recognized by Turkey. Even now, decades later, Ankara still maintains something in the region of 35,000 troops there. And you better believe the Turkish government uses this to its geopolitical advantage. Like Moscow, Ankara wants to keep Cyprus from drifting too close to the west. While the island was able to join the EU in 2004, it isn't within NATO. Not that, Tur not that Turkey's main goal is to leave the nation unable to defend against a future invasion. Rather, Ankara wants access to offshore hydrocarbon resources as well as to use Cyprus's coast to project its naval power. Now, by this point, it's hopefully becoming clear that the existence of a powerful outside actor is another necessary condition for these frozen conflicts. Russia in most post-Soviet spaces, the USA as a security guarantee for Taiwan, and Turkey on the island of Cyprus. In fact, Turkey is connected to a couple of these conflicts. Well, one frozen conflict and one formerly frozen conflict which recently reignited. In Nagorno-Karabakh, the main tensions are between Armenia and Azerbaijan. But the unfinished war is also a proxy fight between three local frenemies, Turkey on the Azeri side and Russia and Iran on Armenia's. But Ankara is also a key player in one of the newest such conflicts out there, that involving northeast Syria. During the Syrian civil war, the Assad regime effectively lost control of the country, leading to the rise of multiple statelets, warlords, and, most infamously, the ISIS caliphate. While most of these either crumbled or were destroyed, up in the northeast, something more enduring emerged. 
The Kurdish Autonomous Administration of Northeast Syria, or AANES, is an unrecognized state of about 5 million that controls many of Syria's oil and gas fields. You may have heard of its army, the People's Protection Units, or YPG, and they were instrumental in the defeat of ISIS, and their soldiers still guard tens of thousands of captured militants. But while AANES holds territory within Syria and considers the Assad government one of its foes, it's not Damascus that's the major player here. Rather, the reason AANES continues to exist is due to a hyper-complex swirl of relations between three major powers. The USA, which the Kurds helped defeat ISIS and now feels a duty of care towards them. Turkey, which considers the AANES to be linked to Kurdish militants in Turkey and wants to destroy it. And Russia, which backs Assad and is against the AANES. In this way, the Northeast Syria situation is a clear example of how complex these frozen conflicts can be, how they're sustained not just by facts on the ground, but by a delicate dance between powerful outside forces, a dance that makes them inherently unstable. There's a reason we subtitled this video, Predicting the Sites of Future Wars. It's because of the horrible ease with which the slightest change in either local, regional, or big power relations could heat any of these conflicts right back up. In this sense, frozen conflict is probably the wrong name for it. More apt, if impossible to say with a straight face, might be something like Jenga conflicts, because of the way the tiniest shift could collapse everything in an instant. Just look at one of the most complex of them all, the situation between Kosovo and Serbia. There, Kosovo is the breakaway, semi-recognized state backed by a powerful outside actor, the US and NATO. But it also contains its own breakaway region, the Serbian-majority enclaves in the north, which reject Pristina's authority and run themselves as semi-independent statelets. In this case, they're backed by Serbia, which is pushing a peace agreement known as the Community of Serb Municipalities, which would give these enclaves massive amounts of autonomy and the power to appoint their own police forces and judiciary. Uh, we could go on unpacking the Matryoshka dolls, discussing how Serbia itself is backed by Moscow, but you get the idea. Like Taiwan, like Cyprus, like AANES or Transnistria, Abkhazia or South Ossetia, Kosovo is a complex place. One where the war has been both over for years, yet simultaneously never ended. A place where conflict could potentially break out again with little warning. Because as we're going to see in the next chapter, that's the scary thing about these frozen conflicts their ability to quickly heat back up, to quickly go from uneasy peace to brutal warfare. For most outsiders, the violence seemed to blow up out of nowhere. After decades of tense peace, bar a four-day dust-up in 2016, the contested Nagorno-Karabakh region exploded in fall of 2020. As most of the world was glued to the news of the ongoing pandemic, Armenia and Azerbaijan fought a brutal six-week war over the ethnic Armenian enclave within Azeri territory. Perhaps 7,000 were killed. Tens of thousands of civilians were driven from their homes. By the time the dust settled, Azerbaijan had successfully conquered swaths of territory once de facto controlled by Armenians. Yet this wasn't the end. Two years later, in fall of 2022, Baku launched a fresh attack, one that lasted a mere two days but still managed to kill around 300 people and see yet more territory in Nagorno-Karabakh fall to Azeri forces. If you want more detail on the backgrounds, we once did a whole video on Nagorno-Karabakh that summed up the issues and history quite well. But for our purposes today, the key part is the conflict had frozen way back in 1994. Aside from those four days in 2016, it had remained that way ever since. So what happened? What caused an effective 26-year ceasefire to suddenly collapse into horrendous violence? The answer is a terrifying study in how quickly outside factors can reignite these conflicts. Back when the 1994 ceasefire was declared, Armenia was the effective winner. Backed by Russia, Yerevan had been able to bring firepower to bear that Azerbaijan just couldn't match. In the quarter century since, though, regional politics has undergone a seismic shift. Massive investment in oil and gas extraction has boosted Azerbaijan's state budget, a budget then spent buying advanced military equipment from its powerful back of Turkey. And while Armenia was still technically backed by Russia, Vladimir Putin had been growing personally closer to both Azerbaijan's Ilham Aliyev and to Turkey's President Erdogan. In particular, Russia had closed a major deal in 2019 to supply Turkey with S-400 missile defense systems, a blow to NATO that Putin didn't want to jeopardize. By 2020, Baku was clearly able to sense it at the advantage, and when war came, 
it didn't disappoint. In the opening hours, Turkish bought TB2 drones destroyed Nagorno-Karabakh's air defenses, turning Armenia's tanks into sitting ducks. Although Moscow would eventually impose a ceasefire, it wouldn't be until its supposed ally Armenia had lost thousands of square kilometers of territory. With hindsight, we can now see that while the reignition of the conflict was sudden, it was the outcome of a slow process that saw the balance of power change, both between Armenia and Azerbaijan, but also between Russia and Turkey, a change that led Baku to calculate that the rewards of restarting the fight were worth the risks. The two-day follow-up in 2022 has an even clearer cause. With Russia badly bogged down in Ukraine, the Azeris gambled that Russian peacekeepers installed after 2020 wouldn't dare interfere. What followed was a wholly opportunistic land grab that took place at the exact moment the Kremlin was reeling from Ukraine's Kharkiv counteroffensive. In short, a shift caused one side to recalculate its risk-reward ratio and decide conditions were now favorable. But actors in these conflicts don't respond only to opportunities and positive changes. They might also be reacting to a negative change or even an absence. Such was the case with the Western Sahara conflict, which resumed in 2020 after a 29-year ceasefire. Again, the conflict itself is immensely complicated, but the simplified version is that during decolonization, Spain agreed to the creation of two independent countries, Morocco and the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic. But Morocco instead claimed all territory as its own. This sparked a war that dragged on until 1991, when a ceasefire was agreed on the basis of a future referendum over Western Sahara's sovereignty, as well as the creation of a UN buffer zone. Now, what caused the fighting to re-erupt in 2020 is likewise a long, winding tale, one involving road blockades and violations of the UN buffer zone on top of grievances related to Morocco never holding the agreed referendum. But it was at least in part fueled by the sudden resignation of the UN envoy to the region and the subsequent months-long suspension of negotiations. With an acceptable path to peace closed off and Morocco, in their eyes, violating ceasefire conditions every day, representatives of the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic felt they had no choice but to take action. Actions that ultimately led to the resumption of war. These are just two recent examples. While we don't intend it to be an exhaustive list, it certainly shows the sort of complex factors that lead to renewed war. The scariest part? It's all too easy to see how similar conflicts could likewise roar back to life. Over in Asia, Xi Jinping might decide the balance of military power is tipped far enough in his favor to move on Taiwan. In northeast Syria, a change of relations with the U.S. could leave Turkey feeling it as carte blanche to move against the AANES. Or hey, maybe a total Russian defeat in Ukraine empowers Georgia to reclaim Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Conversely, Putin might try to stop Moldova's urgent moves to join NATO by reigniting the Transnistria War. We really don't know. And none of these are firm predictions on our part about how the future may play out. What they are, though, are warnings. Warnings on the dangerous nature of these unfinished conflicts, on the ways they can destabilize not just the states they take place within, but also, potentially, the entire world. It could be that none of these frozen conflicts ever reignite. It could be that most or even all of them do. All that is certain is that when it comes to predicting the sites of future wars, it is these frozen conflicts that, sadly, may hold the greatest potential for bloodshed. And that's something that should deeply concern us all.